Hey, the number has gone red. Apparently, this is recording. Groovy. The mouse is showing. Should be. Should have been showing last time. No guarantee it was. Yeah, I uploaded a video with several of these maps and some other images to YouTube back on the 22nd of April, and recently saw a video that was posted on the 1st of May by someone else. Trout Sucker Tsviant Fiatsig, something like that. I, don't, I forget who. The video I uploaded, as far as I watched it, seemed to, seemed to have worked all right on the part that was doing um, the distances between various points. It apparently didn't work so well once I got onto these maps. Well, maybe YouTube can't analyze them. Anyway, right in the center here, where I shall click and I can just zoom in and click, just to make sure that the mouse cursor shows up. That is Adelaide, Australia. And Australia probably looks about right to anyone who's familiar with the map of Australia. New Zealand, uh, East Timor, Indonesia, S Sumatra, various things up here. I think Borneo is one of them. Uh, Malaysia might be in the area. Don't look too bad. Antarctica may be a little distorted there. You've got the, the shape of Vietnam about right. Why is it centered on Adelaide? Well, it's handy if you're doing flight times to Adelaide because the distances on a great circle passing through Adelaide Airport, which is what's exactly at the center there, will be correct. If you go all the way out here, that's Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Central African Republic, Congo, Democratic Republic, Congo, something Congo. I mean, this is South Africa, this is Namibia, that must be Angola. Places like Morocco, Sierra, Sierra Leone, Equatorial Guinea are out here. And well, I'm zoomed in all this way, you probably... Oh, wait. Algeria, Libya. This is Morocco. This long strip here and down here. And you've got Western Sahara is this huge strip down here. And you may think it's a bit wrong for... Morocco to be shown, you know, all the way down here and all the way up here when Saudi Arabia is only this big. Also, this is Britain. We've got Scotland, Hadrian's Wall somewhere here, Lake District, Wales, this bit on the left, Scotland there, Cornwall out there, and Devon, London, for anyone who cares, is about here. And of course Ireland, the whole Republic of Ireland up here and Northern Ireland, this bit. If I zoom out, you can compare that Britain to Australia and think, surely north to south long Britain isn't as far as east to west across Australia. So we've got some distortion going on. And you've got really bad distortion if you come over here. Look, look what's happened to Brazil down here. Assuming my mouse cursor is showing up, it should be clicking on Brazil. If it's not showing up, just look in the sort of the bottom quarter of the image about the five o'clock, well, in the general direction of the 160 and 170 degree marks around the perimeter. You've got this huge arc of Brazil. That's looking huge. Like, compare it to Australia in the center, it's enormous. This is not right, this is distortion. And, yeah, look at the size of Florida way out on the right compared to California, not quite as far right for anyone who's not familiar with any geography outside the USA. It all looks a bit wrong. There's Adelaide. I've got another one for Ait Ben Hadou, only it's not centered on Ait Ben Hadou, it's centered at the antipode of Ait Ben Hadou. It's pretty close to Australia again. Even close to New Zealand. Yes, folks, New Zealand does exist. It's these islands right here. Ait Ben Hadou is a place that has been in dozens of TV series and films and shows and music videos and all kinds of things. Look up Sarah Brightman singing Conte Patiro solo. Just a few seconds, she's actually in the riverbed in front of Ait Ben Hadou. Uh, it was used in Gladiator, I think it's been in Game of Thrones. It is all the way around the outside of this map. That's why it says Antipode in the title. You can see that up in the top left. If you can't, tough luck. Centred somewhere in the ocean, and the closer you get to that spot in Morocco, the worse the distortion gets. Morocco is wrapped around the entire Earth there, which is just a ridiculous notion. 
you may also note that, well, you know, you can see India and recognize the shape of India, but beyond that, you've got the Caspian, and then you've got this kind of stunted or stretched north to south Turkey, and then you've got this immense Greece north to south, and then it's kind of hard to be sure what's going on beyond that because the distortion gets so bad. I believe the next streak up is that huge kind of axe head triangle shape is Sicily, and then you've got enormous streak of Italy, and above it are Sardinia and Corsica. And France is vastly across the right. You can see Britain Island there, which kind of gives it away. And Spain and Portugal, this huge thing in the top right, around the um, from 20 degrees around to 60 degrees. And that blue streak from 60-some degrees all the way back around to about 268 degrees, all the way across the north, is the Mediterranean. That is serious distortion. Look at that and compare it to the size of Australia. Massive distortion. What's next? What's next is on centered in Buenos Aires. If you're flying to or from Buenos Aires, the distance on this map should roughly correspond to your flight time. And in this one, Antarctica looks all right. South America looks all right. The USA isn't too badly distorted. Although people in Texas aren't going to be happy about how much bigger Alaska is. I mean, they're already not happy about how much bigger Alaska is, but it's huge! We've got Alaska. We could eat the rest of the USA. And then you have this kind of, this Russia problem. And a China, an even bigger China problem. That is China stretch around from the top left all the way around the top right, down the right hand side, and down across the bottom. That's, that's us being way out landmassed. And we've got Australia, it's looking a bit weird. And all the stuff down there is stretched out. And Vietnam is huge. Who's next? Who's next is kind of zoomed in. It's not the whole map, it's just centered on Cape Town, just for distances from Cape Town. It does show enough map. I think it shows most of the landmass, because it's got Pacific Ocean around the outside, so there's almost nothing to see. And again, look at the distortion at the west coast of the USA. Look at the distortion across, um, across Japan on the right side of this image. Again, it's not looking right. Antarctica's still looking right, because the center's somewhere near Antarctica. The Mediterranean doesn't look too bad. Most of Europe, in fact, doesn't look too bad. But the, out the outer stuff is stretched to insanity. And this is Chile. If you can see the title, it says Chile Quake AE Map. I'll come back to that. It's centered. Well, you can't really see where it's centered there, but it is centered pretty much on the coast of Chile rather than in a particular city or at a particular airport. And this one, you see the outside is once again China. China's quite a big place. There's a lot of the Earth that is opposite part of China. So you quite often get China around the outside. Not as often as you get the Pacific Ocean, but it happens. Here is an example of, of of which ocean? The Southern Ocean being around the outside. Because <coughs> you have the USA in the center. It's heading on Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, which is a large area, but it's not anything like as large as the area covered by these you know, two pixel wide stripes going through it. And you have the USA shown pretty much correctly. I mean, if somebody gave you that as a map of the USA, you'd say it's kind of low resolution. But you wouldn't say it's badly distorted. Mm, you might not even complain about Argentina, although I don't think Argentina's quite such a wide shape, really. But if you look at South Africa and Lesotho and whatever the other one is... I'm sorry, I, there are two little landlocked mini-nations there, and I can only remember one of their names. South Africa is apparently bigger than the USA. Madagascar, looking at this map, this thing over on the right here, is... Uh, yeah, that would stretch from the north edge of Alaska all the way down into Mexico. That's not right. India and Sri Lanka actually don't look all that badly distorted. They are relatively foreshortened or widened. I mean, Sri Lanka is not that shape, but it's still recognizably India. But just look at the size of all this stuff here in the top left, which is all those little island nations and tiny islands and tiny chains of islands, and compare them to, say, the whole USA or the East Coast here. You've got New England. I mean, 
whichever island that is, would stretch from Newfoundland down into Panama. And that's not and look at look what's happened to Australia. Like what the heck has happened to Australia? It's been distorted. Badly. And here's another one. Oh, if you want to actually get these maps for yourself, this is the header that comes with it. I've cut it off most of them, but look up NS6T, Azimuthal Map, and you can find this guy's site that generates them. You're supposed to be able to enter the centers like this. It didn't work for me, but you can copy the coordinates from a Google Maps, zoom in on what you want at the center, straight into his center thing, and it'll generate a map for you. This one is centered in the sea, just off, excuse me, you click with the mouse to make sure it shows up. It is centered obviously where the two fat lines cross in the sea, just off this island here, which is quite a large island with Kyoto, Osaka, and Tokyo, if I remember correctly. Sorry if I don't. Also, inconveniently for people living there, Fukushima. It's about here. That's where the earthquake was centered, and I believe this was a 9.0. It's been a while since I looked this up. I said I originally made this video and uploaded it back in April, and it just turns out to be mangled by YouTube. But this was an earthquake just off the Japanese mainland. Uh, well, this is the location of the epicenter of an earthquake just off the Japanese mainland that caused a lot of damage, including to a nuclear power station. And if I zoom in here, you've got a map of Japan, which will be familiar to anyone who knows Japan. You've got a map of the Chinese coast and the Korean peninsula. So this thing here, which looks about right. North Korea, South Korea. 38th parallel. Um, it's not exactly the 38th parallel, but it's pretty close to the 38th parallel. The 38 degrees north line of latitude. So Seoul and Pyongyang. And you've got Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Burma to some, Myanmar to others. India is here and here. Bangladesh is stuck in between them and slowly disappearing as sea level rises. That little dot is Bhutan. This streak is Nepal. There's an area up here that some people call Tibet. This is Afghanistan. This is, sorry, this is Afghanistan. It's Iran. This is Pakistan. This is where the Iranians have been fighting like mad for decades to keep uh, Taliban heroin off Britain's street. Somewhere here, there's a disputed region called Kashmir, where India and Pakistan can't agree who controls it. And probably most of the locals would quite like to rule it themselves and not be paying taxes and not have all this fighting and killing going on. But at least some of them think of themselves as very definitely Indian or very definitely Pakistani and hate anyone who disagrees. And all of this isn't too badly distorted. I'm not quite sure why there are no borders drawn in this region. Maybe it's all the border disputes. And this doesn't look too bad. And these islands down here, like Sumatra and Java Head. South by Java Head, woohoo. And East Timor and uh, Papua New Guinea and whatever the rest of these are called. They don't look too bad. And Australia may be a little bit stretched out. Just there to there, maybe a little bit exaggerated. Not too bad though, but when you come across here to Africa, you've got distortion. South Africa, Namibia, Angola, Democratic Republic of the Congo, or whatever that is, whatever that is, whatever that tiny thing is, whatever that is, Nigeria. Uh, help me out here, people. Niger, we've got Mar Mali. Oh, watch out. I thought Mali was. Uh, Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, Western Sahara, maybe that's Mali and that one's Chad. Timbuktu is somewhere there. Uh, little strip of Equatorial Guinea, I think that one's Guinea. Liberian Sierra Leone on the edge there. I'm not quite up to speed on those places. But the really, the really bad distortion is what's going on here with this kind of giant leaping dolphin shape. This, you know bill up here, and then the forehead, and then the body down here, and the tail tapering down this way, which is just Brazil and Argentina. And looking rather too much bigger than everything else, you know, and you've got 
Peru is this narrow strip here, and then you've got Chir where is it? It's Peru that bit. Huh. Colombia, Ecuador. I think maybe that's Peru, and Chile is all the way up here, down to all the way down here. Is that distorted? It's hard to be sure, right? And Patagonia is down this way. Now, anyone who's familiar with it's not like a dolphin or a budgie. Could be either, huh? But anyone who's familiar with South America probably thinks this doesn't look right. And again, there is earthquake in the title of this map. And again, I'll come back to that. This is Honshu Earthquake AE map. And this is another one of my antipode maps. This is a carbo wall. Uh, you may have heard of the carbo stone. If not, you may have heard of Mecca. And you're probably aware of it from religious studies lessons, or from films, or from holidays, or from cartoons, or from your own religious practices, not necessarily in that order, that Muslims at noon on Friday pray in a particular direction. You can, If you're in a Muslim country, you'll see markers on hotel room walls indicating which direction. And you can see mosques that have you know, a, a huge courtyard that used to be the King's Palace or whatever, and then there's a, a funny angle at the end where the mosque was deliberately built in a particular direction. It's facing towards the Kaaba stone in the circular area in the Al-Haram district of the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. A particular, particular rock that's stuck in the middle of this big black cube. And Muslims performing the Hajj pilgrimage go and walk seven times anti-clockwise around that. Well, on this map, which is centered here in the middle of, um, well, near an island, but basically in the middle of a vast area of salt water, the Kaaba stone is the entire edge of the map. And those Muslims are walking seven times clockwise around the entire earth. which you probably think doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And the reason for that is that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Also, Saudi Arabia, being literally the entire perimeter of this map, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And if you try to work out what's going on with the other countries, well, this whole mess in the bottom here, this bit is Ethiopia, and you've got South Africa here in Lesotho, and Namibia, Angola, Democratic Republic of Congo, blah de blah Never say bloody blah, it sounds ridiculous. Equatorial Guinea, huge. Uh, I think that's Sierra Leone and that's Liberia. Mali there, Algeria, Morocco. Egypt, look at the size of Egypt. Talk about the Nile being the longest river in the world. Look at the size of that thing. I think this is the Rift Valley, this black line. And this blue streak here, this kind of... Uh, it kind of looks like a maybe a ghost, you know, with its arms up, going, woo, And it's tapering all the way down here. Way down here. Down between all this African stuff and Saudi Arabia. Well, that'd be the Red Sea opening out into the Arabian Sea, wouldn't it? And I think this might be Somalia right here, sticking out. So, so that's some severe distortion when the Red Sea is... You know, that much bigger than, for example, the whole of the Americas. It's This isn't a particularly useful map for anything. I just thought it was um, kind of amusing to create an azimuthal equidistant map on which Muslim pilgrims actually walk seven times around the entire Earth, if this map is correct. And your immediate reaction is, well, of course it's not correct. I mean, look at Africa. Everyone knows Africa ain't that shape. Even people in Kentucky know Africa isn't that shape. And this is a silly map. Where is this? This is centered on Lisbon, Portugal. Which gets Africa and Europe pretty much right. It kind of stretches out bits of the Americas. And, it, you know, it's it's got Scandinavia near the center. That's all right. It's got the Mediterranean. It's got the Middle East. All that sort of in a circle where you're within 45 degrees and it's not too badly distorted. Iceland looks fine. Uh, within 90 degrees around the globe on a great circle from Lisbon. You've got 
India, Sri Lanka, all of Africa, most of South America, all of North America. You've got the, um, these things, the Aleutian Isles. I think they're all that's, all that's left of a land bridge that was exposed by retreating ice and then covered by rising seas, but did allow Mongols, or the Hmong tribe, originating in Mongolia, now also found in Vietnam and Laos, to migrate across there into the Americas, which is why mitochondrial DNA analysis of Native American tribes finds that they're more closely related to Hmong tribes than to any other non-Native American tribe. All of that looks all right, but then you get this thing. Look at the size of that thing. Cut the chatter red too. Yeah, and this. This little shield shape down here, that which is giving Texas a run for its money on width, beating heck out of it on length, probably out doing it on surface area. This little shield shape here is Tasmania. This huge object is Australia. Compare it to the USA. Look, look at Japan, if you can even find Japan on this map. It's, it's this thing, by the way. It's this thing up here. This bit. Yeah, like they were ever going to take Australia on and win. Look at, the, look at the size difference. You can get lost in there for years. People do. And the really weird part for this would be these things. These huge streaks of land, like this object here. What, what is this thing here? You can't even tell. Can you can you tell what this is? I suspect it may be Hawaii. It's it's sort of in a Hawaiian. Oh, this, these might be Hawaii actually. This is four islands. This this bit might be Hawaii. This this is something else. And this, I mean, there's there's obviously some kind of vast landmass of amazing length there, and it's not Antarctica. We, we've got Antarctica here. It's not as with the Americas, and it's not India, or Africa, or Europe, or Russia. It's not Australia, it's not... I know what it is. I know what it is. It's that thing that's missing from some maps, but isn't missing from these. This thing here, from there, this bit, to here, and pinching off into a narrow straight there, and then from there, all the way around up here, all the way around this left side, that's New Zealand. <laughs> that is New Zealand on this map. New Zealand is absolutely enormous. <laughs> Never mind ultra marathons. Right, you could spend a year just trekking from one end of New Zealand to the other. What would that be on this map? Assuming, I mean, the distances are correct, so it's 20,000 kilometers from center to outside, so that is roughly 60,000 kilometers, so at 20 kilometers a day it would take you 3,000 days. You could spend 10 years trekking the length of New Zealand. If that map's correct. And you're going to say, obviously that map's not correct. You'd be right. Here's one with Old Faithful as the antipode. Again, we're back, we're back to being near, near Australia and near Antarctica. Here, Australia doesn't look too bad. Antarctica doesn't look too bad. Patagonia doesn't look too bad. Much of Africa doesn't look too bad. The Middle East is... Well, the Arabian Peninsula is not too bad bad, you got India, that's alright, all of Indochina, or whatever you want to call it, Southeast Asia, is looking alright. Slight issue with Britain up here, an island, being so large compared to Australia. That's, that's not right. Russia's a little bit stretched out, and then you get to this thing around the outside, well, is North America. See, this bit here is Central America. This is Mexico. <laughs> All the way around to there. This is Baja, California. And uh, then you've got the USA here. And Greenland. And this bit is Canada. This is Alaska. And all of this side is Canada. All the way down here. And the border is somewhere... All right. That's Baja California. This one's California. So you've got Portland and... Uh, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington. Yes, Oregon and Washington states. And then that's Alaska. So I think this is British Columbia. And the Canadian border is across there somewhere. Or something. 
see, it's rather hard to work out what's going on with that map because the distortion is so bad. So, obviously, this map is not correct. It's so not correct, I'm doing strange, non-Russian -for foreign accents, you know, that don't make any sense. Qatar Hamad International Airport, as a model equidistant map, useful only for plotting flight times to and from Qatar Hamad International Airport. It's, ca it's not quite the Kabastones Stones opposite, but this is all the stuff that looked utterly ridiculous on the um, Kabul wall map now looks right, and the stuff that was correct in the centre of that map is now bollocks. Yeah, the Strid Antipode, right. There is a river in Yorkshire, the River Wharf. It starts out as Audershaw Beck and Greenfields Beck, which come together at the head of Langstroth Dale, and they flow east down Langstroth Dale, and then the valley makes a right turn at Buckden, and that becomes the River Wharf flowing down Wharfdale, and Liddendale comes in from the left, and it goes past Kettlewell, Kilnsey, Conistone, Grassington, Appletreewick, and Barden, picking up more and more order as it goes. And as it goes past Barden Bridge and Barden Tower, it is maybe 30 metres wide and maybe one metre deep. You could swim in it, might not want to, it's not all that clean, but you could. You could boat in it, although you're not allowed to. You could wade across it, if it's not in flood. If it's in flood, there are trees coming hurtling down it, and you do not want to try to wade across it. It does seriously flood. But in, you know, after a prolonged dry spell in summer and June, it's peaceful, it's clear, you can see the bottom, you can watch ducks riding the rapids, it's nice. And a couple of miles downstream from there, it's so narrow it looks like you could jump across. But there's even more water going through it, and if you fall in, you never come back to the surface. That's the strid. I've already uploaded video footage of it. This map has the strid all the way around the outside. This is a great flat earth map. This is an absolutely wonderful flat earth map, because this perfectly explains why nobody has ever come back from the edge to re report about it. Because anyone who actually gets to the edge and goes right to the edge has fallen into the strid and drowned. Some of the dead bodies come back, but they never talk. On this one, you've got New Zealand, you've got Australia, you've got Antarctica. They're looking all right, but there's this this bizarreness out here that is Scandinavia and Denmark. And, and again, you can't really tell what this stuff around the right side is because it's so badly distorted. You could probably work it out. It's Well, that's Greenland, that's Iceland. It's got to be part of Europe. Europe is stretched to bits around the outside, right? Saudi Arabia... Turkey, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, uh, Aral Sea, no, Aral Sea is that one, Caspian, Azov maybe, Black Sea, Mediterranean around here, that's Spain, that's Portugal, that's France, oh, of course, the thing around the outside is Britain, Britain, surrounding the entire world, it's no wonder the sun never sets on the British Empire, the sun never sets on Britain, this map can't be right. Who's next? Sydney, Australia. Almost the same thing. Flight times to and from Sydney. Ask Wolfie6020 because he flies to and from Sydney. Can we check whether, you know, distances on this image right here. Take a screenshot and share it. Just send him a timestamp. Pause the video. Right click. Copy link at your current time. Let's see whether it corresponds to his flight times to and from Sydney. I mean, it won't quite because wind happens, but close enough. And we're back to Adelaide. So that's a whole load of azimuthal equidistant maps, and in amongst them were Chile Quake AE map, centred just off the coast of Chile, where uh, might have been an 8.5 quake happened, and Honshu earthquake map, centred just off the coast of Honshu, where a, I think it was a 9.0 quake happened. Said I'd come back to these two, and I will, with two other images. And these are those images. Sendai. Oh, well. <coughs> and Chile earthquakes. I'm sorry this one is so small. I tried to find a bigger one. I failed. Right. What you've got across the bottom is time in minutes. 0, 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300 minutes better than as 5 hours. Vertically, you have two scales. This scale here is one centimetre of displacement of the instrument. 
maybe I should explain the instrument. The instrument is a weight suspended by springs with a pen on its bottom. And it's suspended above a table with a sheet of paper scrolling across it, which is firmly bolted down to the ground. Now, if you were to mount a camera firmly bolted to a wall, which is very solidly built, and pointing at that, when an earthquake happens, you would see that pen shake. But if you get a drone with a camera on it and hover it in that room and an earthquake happens, what you'll see is that the room, the walls, the camera mounting to the wall, the floor, the table, and the scrolling sheet of paper all shake, while that weight with the pen stays still. I mean, neither of these is correct if you look at it from a heliocentric frame of reference, or, you know, but whatever that. Relative to the whole Earth as a frame of reference, in an earthquake, the ground shakes. That shakes the table, it shakes the piece of paper as the piece of paper is scrolling past. And what you've got here is how much the piece of paper got shaken under the pen. On this left side, we have a different scale, distance in degrees. This is all those maps I've just shown have circles on them at 45, 90, 135, and 180 degrees from the center. Distance around the Earth on a great circle, measured in degrees around that circle, from zero, the position of the earthquake. And each of these, that is, of course, distance on the a map centered at the um, epicenter of the earthquake. Each of these tracks is a seismograph track, a seismograph plot using this scale, showing how much that seis seismometer got shaken by the earthquake. They're lined up so that uh, it shows when the shaking happened, and they're positioned with their zeros, their center lines, lined up along this to show how far away from the epicenter they were. And what you get is this, this one nearest the epicenter, you've got a kick there, slight dip, and then this kick, and there's a bit of shaking, and then there's this huge spike, and then a smaller one, and then it trails off. On this next one, you have a slight dip and a kick, and a bit of quiet, and a bit of shaking, and this huge spike, and then smaller spikes, and it trails off. And this pattern repeats. It's the same pattern all the way up. As you can see, especially if I do this, zoom out just that far, from there up here, we have a very, very straight line of that very first twitch. And if you have a, a graph of time and distance, It's a peculiar way around, because the gradient is the inverse of the speed. Steeper the... No, it isn't. Sorry. The gradient is the velocity. I'm so used to seeing plots of distance over time, of how long it takes to get there. But no, a, a graph of distance over time, rather than time over distance. Distance over time is has a gradient of the velocity. So this straight line going up here and a fixed gradient has a fixed velocity. This is waves propagating across or around the surface of the Earth at a particular speed. You can also see another straight line here going up this way, which is slightly slower waves. And this big stripe going up here, which is a slower wave. And the next one going up this line a slower, shallower gradient, which is a slow wave. And then there's this really brutal amount of shaking, which looks like a disaster in a crayon factory, going up here, which is this huge wave, and it's still huge, at this dark blue one, which is somewhere 160 degrees away. So it's not around the... F it's not at the opposite side of the Earth. It's most of the way there. TRIS, whatever TRIS is, it didn't half get shaken. There's displacement. And each of those gradients is a different velocity. You've got 
very high velocity here, you got lower velocity, lower velocity, lower velocity, lower velocity. Lowest velocity is this massive spike here, all going from zero, zero down here. Now this is this is kind of peculiar because earthquake waves come in multiple forms. You get rolling and side to side surface waves, Rayleigh and Love, and I forget which way around. And you get pressure waves going through the planet, and you get side to side waves going through the planet. Pressure and sideways waves are primary and secondary. What you'd expect to see on this would be two sets of waves, and obviously we've got multiple. And those waves will propagate in three dimensions through the rock. Uh, probably the best way to describe this would be to imagine a line of people sitting underwater, give them snorkels, be nice, in a swimming pool. Give them wetsuits as well, because they're going to be there a while, because we need to wait for the water to settle down, to be really still. And above each of them is a ping pong ball floating on the surface. And they sit there and meditate on the meaning of life. Golden unicorns walking through silver forests and wait. Once the water's settled down and gone calm, eventually you toss a brick into the deep end. This brick is going to go gloip. You'll hear it, you'll see the splash. You'll know where it went. This'll, they will hear that brick hit the water. They will hear the splash very fast. That's a pressure wave traveling through the water to their ears because they're underwater. It's even faster than it is through the air. They will hear that. Not instantly, but very fast. Then, the wave front spreading from where the brick was thrown in will reach each of their, along the surface, the actual visible water is going around in circles, it looks like up and down here, will spread from the splash to where they are and will displace the ping pong balls. Imagine doing this in the dark with a UV light and fluorescent ping pong balls. It's a bizarre situation, but it's kind of an analogy for having seismographs. You know where the ping pong balls are, and you can see, or you can tell from the video, when these ping pong balls bounce up and down. But if your brick's not fluorescent, you don't get to see it fall in. So some guy threw a brick into the deep end of the pool. Each of those observers will have the time at which they heard the splash, and the time at which their ping pong ball bounced, and the time difference between the two. If you have a grid of observers, and you know how fast sound travels through water, you can use the times at which they heard the splashes to figure out how much further from one ob observer the splash must have been than from another. Try this with a piece of paper, I'm not going to fire up GIMP and video that to show you, but you can draw a circle, if you know it's, on whatever scale you're working, if you know it's two centimeters further from one observer than from the other, you can draw a circle with a five centimeter radius around one center and a circle with a seven centimeter radius around another in one color, change color and go six centimeters and eight centimeters, change color and go seven centimeters and nine centimeters, and so on. And at the intersections of those circles are possible positions. You draw a line, I think you get a nice smooth curved line, through all those intersections, you get a curved line on your map of where that splash could have been to be two centimeters further from one observed position than the other on your map, and for the splash to take the right number of milliseconds longer to reach the second observer. Do this for every pair of observers, and you get a whole bunch of these curved lines, which all go through the same place, and that's where the splash happened. With this time difference from the first little twitch to this spike, or from this spike to this spike, or whichever it is. Of course, you can do the same thing with the, um, with the ping pong ball bounce. If you know how fast those waves spread across the surface of the ball, you can do the time difference on the ping pong balls to get another set of curved lines, which should be right on top of your first set of curved lines and give you the same answer. This time difference, it's a triangular wedge. It's spreading out with distance in a linear way. So you can get convert from that time difference there to this distance here, from zero. And this allows you to draw a circle around each observer 
and say, we know this splash happened this far from this observer, it's somewhere on that circle. We know it happened this far from this observer, it's somewhere on this circle. We know it happened this far from this observer, it's somewhere on this circle. And all those circles go through the same point, and it's the same, same point. That's where the splash was. With an earthquake, this gets a little complicated because earthquakes can happen at 10 or 20 or 30 or 70 kilometers deep, not just at the surface. You have two things here. You have a focus, which is where it actually happened. You have an epicenter, which is the point on the surface directly above it, which is probably where you're going to get the worst shaking. So you can't just plot the surface position. You actually have to take into account depth, especially if you're close, because if you're almost on top of an earthquake and it happens at very shallow depth, well, you're gone. Sorry. Unless it's a really small one you're going to get that shaking right away. If the earthquake is 70 kilometers down straight below you, and you have another observer 10 kilometers away to your right, excuse me, clicking up the calculator, what you're going to find is that this thing is 70 kilometers from you, and 70 squared plus 10 squared equals square root yeah, oh, 70.71 kilometers away from the observer who's 10 kilometers away from you. Same distance from both of you ought to be halfway in between, but your time difference, this, this thing here, says otherwise. It says it's not halfway between you, it says it's a long way from both of you. That's depth. And this also gets complicated because of something which is not in this vid, there are plenty of vids about it, which is that your pressure waves and side-to-side -side waves going through the rock not just along the surface. In the swimming pool example, we have a pressure wave through the water, we have a side side, we have a rolling wave, sorry, along the surface. Water doesn't do side to side waves. If you stand in the swimming pool and wave your hands side to side, you are not going to create a side to side wave at the other end of the pool that way. Stretch a slinky out between two people and shake one end side to side, a wave, side to side wave travels along that slinky. Push and pull on the slinky, you get a, a compression rarefaction wave. A push-pull wave, a pressure wave, primary wave, going along the slinky. And they'll go at different speeds. This happens with rock. When the waves go down into the earth, they're going into denser and denser media. And pressure waves travel faster through denser media. That's why the speed of sound is very slow at high altitude, and you can do 2.5 times the speed of sound up there, even without doing anything like twice the speed of sound at sea level. And why the speed of sound underwater is so fast. So they get faster, and if they're going from a medium in which they travel slowly into a medium in which they travel quickly, they get refracted towards the medium in which they travel more slowly. This is why light bends towards the, the higher optical density medium, sound bends into the lower physical density medium. Which means these pressure waves going down into the Earth are getting refracted back up. So the time it takes the pressure wave traveling through the Earth to reach the surface isn't a straight line distance through the Earth, and it's not a great circle distance along around the outside of the Earth, it's a curve down and refracted and back up through the Earth. Which complicates your calculations a little. It looks a little like a great circle to me on the diagrams, but the diagrams may not be accurate. If they go too far down, if they're going almost straight down, they are going to go down through the rocky lithosphere across the I forgot what it's called now. It's a boundary down there. This is lithosphere asthenosphere boundary into the plasticky asthenosphere and through that. And that's fine. It still works. In fact, they're in the mantle, but you know, they're in the kind of plasticky part of the mantle. It's fine. But then they hit the liquid outer core and they change speed because they're going from solid plasticky mantle to liquid outer core. They slow down. Sound bends towards the medium, which it travels more slowly. It gets refracted down towards the center of the Earth. Crosses that mantle, liquid mantle. If it hits the, the actual inner core, the solid inner core is going to speed up again, and you get refraction away and then out. It's a bit of a mess. If it misses it, it's just going to go through the liquid outer core. It gets to the far side, and because of curvature and angles and stuff, it's getting refracted away from the center of the Earth, but still inwards. So the, the pressure waves going down from an earthquake, hitting the liquid outer core, 
get focused to the opposite side of the Earth, leaving an annular gap. You have P waves and S waves that never hit the liquid outer core around however much of the Earth they reach. It's kind of, I think it's about 120 degrees-ish, don't quote me on that. Then you get a place where there are no S waves or P waves detected because the S waves didn't make it through the liquid outer core. You can't do side to side waves through a liquid. And the P waves got refracted inwards and missed that area of the Earth. So you get a, an annular ring where nothing's detected. And then you get the area where all those P waves were focused around the, centered on the antipode. Kind of complicated. And you get this wherever the earthquake is, which, you know, over the course of time with enough earthquakes, you get the same circular shape again and again and again. And the same circular shape where the solid inner core has messed it up even more telling you that the outer core and inner core are spherical, not a bunch of bricks or cuboids or dodecahedral or separate blobs or just a fistful of pebbles or whatever, you know, silicone implant shape, whatever that, whatever other shape you might think they might be. Yeah. On this graph, though, we've got straight lines, which is just kind of odd. And we've got no gaps, which is kind of odd. So I think this is all surface waves. But this was from a really big earthquake. This is significant. I reckon with a really big earthquake, those waves that go you know, out at a sh down at a shallow angle and refract back up soon are going to keep doing that again and again, propagating around the surface. Plus you get Rayleigh waves and love waves. So we've got these different wave speeds going up to, what do we got? About there, 90 minutes out. After 90 minutes, those waves have been detected 160 degrees around. They have gone at a steady speed as far around the Earth as they can. And on that Honshu earthquake AE map, these, that makes perfect sense, you know. If that flat, flat Earth map centered just off Japan is correct, this is fine. The first 90 minutes of this graph are fine. Because how long it took the waves to get somewhere corresponds exactly to how far from the center of that map that somewhere is. Makes perfect sense. But then you get the next 90 minutes up to 180. 180 minutes here. So you've got all this jiggling going on. There's a lot of jiggling going on in this room. I like it. The obvious one is this, this stripe here. This and it's it's not is it quite straight or is that slightly curved? Down here. Maybe less obvious because of that though, this one there is a stripe down here along this line. And there's a stripe up here as well. Going up this way. Which is a really peculiar little stripe. I think this may be an afterquake, because it's parallel to one of these earlier ones. But this downward stroke, this line down here, well, where did that originate? There. And what's there? Opposite side of the Earth from the earthquake, or the outer edge of the map, if we're looking at the flat map, it's this line. This line here makes it all the way to the edge of that azimuthal equidistant map, and returns to Hanshu. And then it goes back out again, here. And then it comes back in again. Meanwhile, the slower moving waves, this, the, the disaster in the crayon factory effect here. Oh yeah, all the way out there, far side of the Earth there, all the way back, back to Honshu, there. And back out again. Far side of the Earth there, and back again there. And you can see that multiple times on these faster waves, up there, down to there, up to there, down to there, and up to there. You've got this M shape appearing. So we've got two possible explanations for this. Possible, he says. Well, it's generous. Do like, you like the very calm way I said possible? It's almost as if I believe they might be. One of them is that these waves have hit the edge of the flat Earth, which is opposite Honshu in Japan, not in Antarctica, 
all that distortion on that AE map was correct. Yeah. And these waves have hit the edge of the Earth and come back, focused back in to the center, hit the edge of the Earth there, reflected, came back to the center there, crossed through Honshu, thrust through the epicenter there, and went back out to the edges of the Earth here and came back in this way. The other explanation is that the waves originating here went out there, and at this point here, where there is ocean around the edge of that map and there are no seismographs, seismometers, all those waves just carried on. This is a single point in the ocean opposite Japan, somewhere out in the Atlantic, where all those waves came together from all directions and passed each other. And there was probably quite a sp an interesting splash and just carried on because it's just a spot in the Atlantic. They've got no reason to change direction. They just carried on. And they carried on. That's, that's too big to be just the Atlantic slowing down, isn't it? All the way back around the, all the way around the Earth, each one going around the other side. So they went, some of these will have gone through Russia and across the Atlantic and through America and through the, through the Pacific. And some of these will have gone across the Pacific and through America and through America and across the Atlantic and through Russia and back. And some will have gone through the Arctic and down the Atlantic and to there and down the rest of the Atlantic and through the Antarctic and up through the Pacific here. And they all just came back to Japan. Each one's still going in the direction in which it left Japan. And then they carried on in that direction and did the same thing again, going round great circles. This M plot, uh, that's might not be a proper name for it, but it's an M shaped plot of stuff, doesn't distinguish between the two. There's another M plot. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that crisp M and the sharper one from you got one heck of a shake there, that red line at the bottom. The sharper line up to here, going to the top at... I'm sorry, it's a really crappy image. I didn't, get the, I didn't find the full size one for you. From here where it says 2010, all the way to the far side of the Earth, and back down here at, uh, I'm guessing, 110 minutes? 115-ish, there. And back up to there where it says 8.8. .8. And then back down here at 225 minutes, and then back up, and it's it's lost at this point. By the time it gets around here again, that that little wave is lost. But you've got this slightly stronger wave here. That was what I was looking at, and the much stronger wave here, far side of the Earth at about 100 minutes, slightly less. Back to its origin at about 190 minutes, 180 minutes, far side of the Earth at whatever that is, 200 280-ish. Well, wouldn't that be convenient, you know? 95, 190, 285, and... Let me guess, 380, 360, 380? I reckon 380. Why? Because from there to there, and from there to there, and from there to there, and from there back to here, it would all be the exact same time because it's traveling at a steady speed. Multiples of, in that example, 95 minutes. Yeah, I think I was on 95 minutes. This is the exact same thing as the Japan one. Obviously, you've got the same thing of these waves traveling around the surface of the Earth being detected at a time after the actual time of the earthquake that exactly corresponds to their distance from the distance of the seismometer from the epicenter on a great circle route, meaning you know the, the surface distance, also known as the distance from so it says here, distance from epicenter bracket degrees bracket up there. Zero up to 180. It makes perfect sense that you've got this straight line if, it, if the wave travels at a steady speed. And whether or not the outside of that Chile map is exactly correct, you know, the Chile centered flat earth map is exactly correct, and that is the shape of the earth, or the earth is a globe and this this point up here is just the um, the antipode. 
this M plot make perfect sense for either. Either these waves reflected off the rim of the Earth here and came back the way they'd gone out, now travelling in the opposite direction, crossed over off Chile and hit the opposite side of the rim here and came back and passed Chile here and went off somewhere this way, back repeating their original trip, or set off from Chile past each other, whatever's opposite Chile, and came back to Chile and repeated their original trip here, repeated the exact same trip every time, rather than going back and forth in opposite directions across the flat map. This M plot makes perfect sense for that. However, this one agrees with the globe or a Chile-centered flat Earth map. This one agrees with the globe or a Japan-centered flat Earth map. And I'm pretty sure when I was looking at both those flat Earth maps, I predicted a response of, that can't be right. And in each case, this map, this M plot, makes no sense with the Chile centered flat Earth map. And the Chilean M plot makes no sense with the Japan centered flat Earth map. But they both make sense with the globe. They both work just fine on a globe. So, uh, so what? So this map, which can't be right, isn't right. And this map, which can't be right, isn't right. And the globe? Oh yeah, is right. Probably. Not 100% proven. We don't do 100% proof here. I can prove yeast by leaving the dough to rise. And mathematicians prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2, or the square of the sum of x and y is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. But you can't 100% proof stuff here. What you can do, though, is demonstrate to an extremely high degree of confidence that every single one of these flat earth maps here and you know the whole idea of flat earth in general are as cool hard logic would quite correctly put it bollocks It ain't flat, guys. It's a equipotentially curved oblate rotating spheroid.